Come on, worship with us. Here I Cynthia Louie as she brings us the word of the Lord. Amen. God bless you, sister. <laughs> Hello? Okay. Good to see you all from here again. I'm excited about the word that God has given me this morning. Um, as of last night, I went to sleep, said, Lord, something's missing. I'm going to trust in you, and I'm just going to go sleep <laughs> on the way to church this morning. He finished up the message. Amen? Yeah. It was just a little bit small something. Okay. If you could get ready, turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 28. 
and we're going to start at verse 10, read to verse 15. Genesis 28, 10 to 15. While you're getting that, some background information. Okay, um, we're, we're going into the story of Jacob. And here we have, after Jacob, after deceiving his father Isaac and stealing his brother Esau's blessing, Jacob is instructed by his mother Rebecca to run, to go live with her brother Laban because Esau is so angry with him that he wants to kill him. So on the way to his uncle, uncles, God speaks to Jacob at Bethel in a dream. And from that point on, Jacob changes his ways. Um, are you there at Genesis 28, verses 10 to 15? It says, Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night, because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head. And he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Here is God's Emmanuel blessing promise to Jacob. He tells him, I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go, and I will not leave you until I have accomplished what I have promised. God promises to do a work in us, and he will not leave us nor forsake us. Now, on it, his uncle Laban now just happens to be a deceiver, and throughout the course of his dealings with Jacob, he continues to try to deceive him. See, what Jacob had sown, he was now reaping. For example, Jacob is conned into marrying Laban's oldest daughter, Leah, when he had actually worked seven years for the hand of his youngest daughter, Rachel. So what happens is he works another seven years for Rachel. And after 20 years, finally God tells Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your family. And again he states, I will be with you. And even though it's on God's command that Jacob is returning home, the scriptures tells us that he is greatly afraid and distressed. Why? Because Esau might still be angry with him. Especially when he gets the news that Esau is coming to meet him with 400 men. Okay, you have somebody mad at you. Now they're bringing their buddies. You get kind of nervous. You don't know where they're heading, okay? Now... Go to Genesis 32, Genesis 32, verses 22 to 30. And it says, And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the break of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So the man tells, asks him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. 
And he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. When we see God face to face, there's nothing that can describe that. The work that he continues to do in us. Not only can we see God face to face, but he now lives in us. Verse 24 says, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. The man in the Bible is capitalized. So now, who was that man? The man was God himself. The man was most likely a Christophany. What's a Christophany? It's a visitation of Jesus in the Old Testament. And I want you to look deeper into that sentence. A man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Notice the order of who wrestled with whom. It doesn't say here that Jacob wrestled with the man, but that the man wrestled with Jacob. Once again, we see that it is God who is the initiator. We couldn't get saved unless God moved on us first. First John 4, 19 always says we love him because he loved us first. See, God encountered Jacob because he knew that Jacob was experiencing a crisis of faith. God came to Jacob the first time at Bethel when he was fleeing from Esau and this encounter changed Jacob for the rest of his life. If you read the scriptures, he no longer deceived anybody else. When he was with Laban, Laban, he wasn't deceiving him. Now his life had come full circle. He was going back to face Esau and, the, and his faith was wavering. He needed God's assurance that everything would be all right. And God knew this. When Jacob left Laban, Laban had come after him and there was a confrontation and a slight altercation. Upon leaving Laban for the final time, Genesis 32, one tells us, so Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. Okay, if angels of God meet me, I'm kind of confident, oh, everything's good. God's sending his angels. But it should have had a calming effect on Jacob, but it just wasn't enough. He needed a direct contact. He needed a direct encounter with God himself. He needed to hear the spoken word of God. Jacob had just got past wrestling with Laban. Maybe not in physically, <laughs> not physically, but he wrestled with him. And now he was looking towards his impending struggle or so-called wrestling match with Esau. God came to Jacob at a time, at this time, because he wanted Jacob to realize that his real struggle was not with Laban, was not with Esau, but was with him, self. Jacob's struggle was with God himself. And the struggle was, who's in charge of your life? On the outside, Jacob seemed to know exactly what to do and what to say. But inside, he was in turmoil because he had not completely yielded to the Lord. Remember, it was the Lord who told him, go back home, I'm with you. Many times, our faith is not true substance faith. It's not the God kind of faith. God uses trials to reveal to us what kind of faith we really have. Jacob was so fearful because he was lacking genuine faith. And God knew this. So God wrestled with Jacob so Jacob could empty himself of himself. He needed to empty himself of his thoughts, his ideas, and his motives. You know, just as a side note, it's interesting that the ford Jacob and his family crossed over before his encounter with God was called Jabbok, which means pouring forth or emptying. Now, why did God wrestle Jacob until the breaking of the day? Isn't God superior? Couldn't he have overpowered Jacob sooner? Of course he could have, but it took that long for Jacob to empty himself 
of his own strength, self-confidence, and cleverness. You know, we think ourselves really clever sometimes. God says, no, 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 no. And we still say, yes, 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 yes. Okay? It takes so long for us to empty ourselves. We reach these points where these trials just zap us of our strength. But still we say, no, I think this is the best way. And God says, let go, let go. Give me control. See, Jacob was greatly blessed with livestock, riches, and family. And in hopes of softening Esau's, Esau's heart and finding favor with him, he sends ahead an abundance of gifts. But the truth is, the only thing or the only one that can soften the heart of an enemy is God. It is only by the grace of God that a person can forgive. You can try, 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 but it is only by his grace that you can forgive. Towards the end of his wrestling match with the Lord, I believe that Jacob finally saw the light. He realized that his own efforts could not give him the peace and recon reconciliation with Esau that he desired. When Jacob receives this revelation, I believe it is at this point that the Lord touches the socket of Jacob's hip and puts it out of joint. And at that time, Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Okay? And the Lord's response. Go back to Genesis 32, 27 to 28. It said, so he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. The Lord had Jacob confess who he had been before their encounter at Bethel, that he was a deceiver, a supplanter, and a con man. Once Jacob confessed this, God changes his name to Israel, giving him a guarantee of a new destiny and a new nature. Israel means prince with God or one who prevails. If Jacob prevailed with God, he would also prevail in other things especially in his meeting with Esau. Although in the natural, Jacob lost the encounter. In the spiritual, he had a great victory. He learned to be triumphant in defeat and strong through weakness. Turn to 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 11. Second Corinthians twelve seven to eleven. It says, "And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure." Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God wants us to come to the point when we pour out all our strength and say, when I am weak, I am strong. Like the Apostle Paul, Jacob was left with a thorn in the flesh. From the day he wrestled with the Lord, Jacob walked with a limp which probably served as a reminder to him about his need for God, so that self would not reign again in his life. Though in the physical, Jacob's walk was crooked. In the spiritual, his walk was straight. In the beginning, Jacob wanted God to bless him, but he did not want to give God lordship over his life. He wanted God to get him out of trouble, but he still wanted to run his life his own way. He had a difficulty in truly submitting to God 
and trusting him. And his faith was based more on his efforts and not on the Lord's. But if you think about it, isn't that true about us also? We have difficulty relinquishing total, total control to God, and we tend to trust our own efforts more than his. That's why, like Jacob, we need to spend time alone with God and allow him to empty us of our own strengths, desires, and ways so that we can be reminded of our identity in Christ, that we are children of God and that we are no longer under law where we do the living, but under grace where Christ does the living through us. When it is Christ who is doing the living through us, this is when we will see the God kind of faith, the substance faith, the without a doubt kind of faith in action. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So how do we believe and how do we seek him? It's really all by God's grace. As God's grace comes upon us, we will be able to diligently and continuously listen and study his word until the Logos word becomes a revelatory Rema word to us. Why is it important that the Logos word becomes a Rema word? It's because the Rema word is the one that will change our lives. Amen. When God spoke to Jacob, the Rema word, that's when his life changed. First at Bethel, and then after he wrestled with him, God said, I will be with you and your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. Reminding him that his identity had actually undergone a change with their first encounter, but it was cemented at the second encounter. Likewise, our identity was changed in our first real encounter with Christ. It's just that we keep forgetting who we are in him. You know, just about a month ago, Pastor Lloyd shared that many times we hear the phrases, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Mm. Or, the Old Testament is the New Testament contained, and the New Testament is the Old Testament obtained. Mm. But recently, he met someone that told him, you know, the real new covenant is the Rema word from the Old Testament and the Rema word from the New Testament. I went, phew, because God always gives me Old Testament. You ever notice oh, when I preach, it's Old Testament? But don't put God in a box. He can change that at any time. But I thought, that's cool. Do you know that even as a young boy, Jesus studied and discussed the word? Turn to Luke chapter 2, 45 to 49. Luke chapter 2, 45 to 49 says, Now, so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting, oops, from 46. Now, so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to them, him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? 
See, Jesus was 12 years old when he was left behind by his parents in Jerusalem, and they had to go back to look for him, and they found him at the temple discussing the word. What was his father's business? At the age of 12, could it, could it have been to learn as well as share insights regarding the word of God? When he reached adulthood, we know that Jesus preached the word, and the people came to hear. Romans 10.17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If you could take the time, those of you who have the New King James Bible, to turn to that scripture, Romans 10.17, because I want you to look at something. Because it's regarding the word comes. Okay. The word comes in this scripture, if you notice, is italicized, which means it was not in the original Bible transcripts, but was only added as an aid to give a continu continuity in thought to the scriptural verse. Sometimes the italicized words are helpful but at other times they can cause us to be slightly misled and lose the meaning of the verse. Instead of saying faith comes by hearing, we could say faith is stimulated by hearing. Faith in us is stimulated by hearing and hearing by the word of God. See, the word stimulates faith, but it does not produce faith. Hearing the word of God does not produce faith in you. Confessing the word of God does not produce faith in you. Singing the word of God does not produce faith in you. By his grace, what it does is it stirs up the faith that's already in you. It arouses and stimulates the faith that's in you into action. It stimulates Jesus. Jesus loves it when the word of God is being discussed. Why am I pointing this out? It's because we don't have to wait for faith to come. Faith has already come. Turn to Galatians chapter 3 verses 23 to 25. Galatians 3, 23 to 25 says, But before faith came, faith has come. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under the tutor. Question, are we still under the law? No. no, we are under grace. Therefore, faith has already come. Faith has already come in the person of Jesus Christ. When we accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, he came to dwell in us and he brought his faith with him. In fact, when Jesus came to dwell in us, he not only brought his faith, but he also brought so many other gifts. He brought love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, forgiveness, wisdom, just to name a few. See, Ephesians 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And Romans 8.32 tells us, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Amen. He didn't say some things. He said all things. 
when God sacrificed his son on the cross for us, he already gave us the greatest gift he could. So now why would he hold back anything else? Faith is a gift from God so we can believe for the promises of God. As with any gift, you can't work for it. You just receive it. If you work for it, then it's a wage. A gift is freely given. This means we never have to labor or work to produce faith because Jesus' faith is perfect faith. And can you add to perfection? No, perfect is perfect. <laughs> See, the big note, big note. <laughs> a God kind of faith is not dependent on works, but on Christ living in us. You cannot have mountain-moving faith apart, apart from Christ. Faith begins with Christ, and faith ends with Christ. Turn to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 2. Are my youth awake? <laughs> Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. They all flew in. They're kind of jet-lagged. Yeah. That's Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race. What race? The race of faith that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Point one, Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. And point two, Jesus was able to endure the cross because he wasn't focused on the pain of the cross. What was he focused on? He looked ahead to the promise of the Father to the joy that was set before him, the joy of the reconciliation of God and man. The God kind of faith focuses on the promise, not on the progress, not on the trial, not on the circumstance, and not on the pain. The God kind of faith focuses on the promise. So, if we have the God kind of faith already in us, why do we not see it in operation? Good question. It's because, like Jacob, our flesh is strong, and we want to do the living, and we want to do the believing our way. And many times our believing has misconceptions and wrong motives. Sometimes we hinder ourselves from receiving God's grace. So how do we stop being a hindrance? Hindrance. We need to hear the word of God continuous, continuously. Why? So that the Christ in us can rise up. When we get out of the way, that's when Christ can rule and reign in and through our lives. Jesus is the speeding car coming fast towards you. Get out of the way. He'll plow and make the way. Okay? Just get out of the way. Last week, Richard shared about how he and Moko, Miyoko have been listening to the messages on grace for over two years. And he said that they weren't even aware at first about how they were being changed from the inside out until Pastor Lloyd made a comment to them that he had noticed that they seemed to be getting set free and were more relaxed. And Richard called this the process of spiritual osmosis. See, when we hear the word of God continuously, even though we may not be able to see it or even realize it, God is always doing a work in us. Okay. I had a personal experience. As I've been continuously listening, studying the word, spending time with God, on Black Friday, I went shopping with my husband and my son at 6 a.m. <laughs> we were in Banana Republic and was I was asking their opinion on a gift for my mother, of my father, I'm sorry, my brother. And they were no help at all. 6 a.m., 
no help at all. Okay? So I got frustrated. But then all of a sudden, my son tells me, Mom, you scared the guy. <laughs> you know, I'm in a daze, right? 6 a.m., come on now. What guy, I asked, because I didn't see anybody next to me. Apparently, he had walked away. What? Did I grab the shirt he was looking at, I asked? Then I noticed my son and my husband were looking at me very strangely. And my, ma my son said, Mom, you were speaking in tongues. <laughs> I was really shocked because I didn't even know I was speaking out in tongues. But you know what? My re response to my frustration was correct. I turned to the Christ within me. No sense, I bat, 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 bat to them. It's not gonna work. So apparently God just automatically took over and I started to speak out in tongues not even being aware of it. I really feel sorry for the guy. I don't think I was speaking that loud. <laughs> but don't speak in tongues, okay? Um, with, around people who don't understand what tongues is, okay? You're gonna freak them. No. But I thought, gee, as a child of God though, my citizenship is in heaven. So isn't it natural that tongues should be my first language rather than English? <laughs> In times of trials, tongue should be my first language. Because all I do when I speak English is upset my husband. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, when I speak in tongues in front of him, you don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> so he can't get mad. I'm just talking to God. So if I can call Rodney up in conclusion, I need you to know that God wrestles with you through your trials whether they be health problems, relationship problems, financial problems, or any kind of problems. He wrestles with you and says, empty yourself of your thoughts, your ways, your plans, your schemes, your strengths, because my ways and my thoughts are higher than yours. And why does he do this? It's because he wants to release his faith through you. As we hear the word of God continuously, and as Christ increasingly has reigned over our lives, this is when Christ will do the living and believing through us, and we will see the God kind of faith in operation. And what is that God kind of faith? It's the kind of faith that has Jesus saying through you, mountain be removed and be cast into the sea and it will be done rise up and walk and the lame will walk cancer come out and cancer will come out and he cancer will bow to the Christ in Pastor Lloyd faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen because Jesus is our Emmanuel blessing, who will never leave us nor forsake us, we will never lose him. And if we can never lose him, we will also never lose his faith. We're blessed with Jesus and all his gifts forever. We already have the God kind of faith because Christ lives in us. As we receive more and more of his grace, Things will just happen. We won't have to do it. We'll ultimately come to the place where we won't even have to think about letting Jesus do the work through us. He'll just do it. It'll happen naturally. When we breathe, we don't think about it. We just do it. If you're struggling to believe, then it's you trying to believe. Just relax. Rest and rejoice in Christ because it's all by God's grace. But when Christ does the living and the believing through us, that's when all things become possible. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. 
We thank you, Lord, that it is Christ who dwells in us now, Lord. And he brought with him his earth-shattering, mountain-moving faith. And he just waits for us to get out of the way so he can rule and reign in our life. And then when he starts doing that, Lord, we know that miracles will take place. All problems in our lives solved because Jesus is our problem solver. So this day, Lord, we thank you for your grace to come upon us, Lord, so that we can truly die to self and get out of the way. I thank you, Lord, that our prayer for this day is, Jesus, be king of my life. Be king in everything that I do. And Lord, this day, we just thank you, Lord, that God, you have imparted, you have imparted in each individual here a revelation, Lord, that we can just rest and that we can relax and that we don't have to do because Jesus has done it all. We thank you for all things. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, uh, grace and faith filled. Amen. Amen.